Hi, Bill Dudera here. Welcome to my channel. Today's case, surgical treatment of tooth number 11. You won't believe what happened to me on this one. Stay tuned. Find out what happened and find out how I managed it. Tooth number 11 diagnosed with previous root canal treatment and asymptomatic apical periodontitis. It's the distal abutment for a three unit fixed partial denture. We also see there's a fiber post inside this case. We see one root canal system treated, well centered. This is very thin alveolar bone from buccal to palatal. If we look at that crown to root ratio, we measure about eight and a half to about 10. So pretty darn close to a one to one crown to root ratio. The intraoral exam shows no signs of swelling or infection. The patient is completely symptom free. After discussing all the options, risks, and benefits with this patient, it was decided that the surgical root canal treatment would be the best option moving forward. This high mucal gingival junction line has lended this area to an extremely favorable band of attached gingiva. And after bone sounding, the height of the alveolar bone was also at a favorable level to consider an aesthetic flap design. So I designed a very conservative submarginal flap. The incision was made with no issues and the flap was reflected. And so far, everything was going just as planned. What followed during this routine surgical procedure shook me a little bit. And I don't get flustered very easily. So here's what happened. As I started removing tissue and was trying to get a sample for a biopsy, the volume of tissue that I was seeing wasn't making sense to me. I generally like to curette the entire lesion until I'm down to sound bone. But every time I pulled out a piece of tissue, it seemed like there was more behind it. As I was pulling out this tissue, it started looking a bit strange to me, not what I'm really used to seeing during apical surgeries. I took a real good look at that tissue, and I saw rugae. That's right, I saw rugae. And then it dawned on me, I'm not in the lesion. I have lost my orientation. So I stopped, and I took a mirror, and I looked at the palate. I was never in the lesion. I had single-handedly made a big hole in the attached gingiva in the vault of this patient's palate. I was horrified. I was sick to my stomach. You know that feeling. Not only do we have to manage a significant iatrogenic issue, but now we have to manage our own self and start controlling those little tremors that take over. Sometimes it's best just to step away, collect your thoughts, take some deep breaths before you do something and make it worse. Because those next few moments will dictate how the remainder of the treatment goes. So although I don't have any photos to document this, because I did get a bit flustered here, and this was a midday surgery, so this was setting me behind too. So I aborted taking any photos at this point in time, and I just focused on moving forward with the treatment and repairing the damage, because we still have a tooth here, and the tooth is still connected to a three-unit fixed partial denture, and we still have to manage that. So let's deconstruct a little bit more of what I think happened here. After, or possibly while resecting the root end, a perforation of the palatal cortical plate occurred and I didn't recognize it. And although I felt like I was being very conscious about keeping my instruments within that very thin, narrow band of alveolar bone, I wasn't in alveolar bone at all, but I was scraping up against the palatal vault. So I wanna walk you through what I did next, the steps I took to manage this, because this is a complication. We still have to manage the root end. The root end had already been resected, so I just prepared a root end preparation with ultrasonics, and placed a root end restoration with a bioceramic material. Once completing the surgical root canal treatment, I began repairing the damage. The tissue was basically macerated on that palatal aspect, so I couldn't really make any flaps or pull any primary intention together, releasing any periosteum. That really wasn't an option for me. So my first step was to place a collagen membrane through from the buccal to the palatal to create some sort of internal barrier. Then I placed some DFDBA grafting material directly on the collagen membrane. I was going to place a graft in this case regardless of the, the iatrogenic air that I created, but I did get a bit concerned with this graft because I had now potentially compromised the blood supply coming from the palate. And if you're grafting, blood supply is everything. 
Following the placement of the grafting material, I then placed a second membrane on the buckle, creating this sandwich type graft with membrane, graft, membrane. Once the membrane on the buckle was in place, I reapproximated the tissue and closed the surgical site on the buckle with interrupted sutures. I then moved my attention to the palatal. I did everything I could and I threw as many sutures as I could in there just to hold the tissue together because it was flapping open. It was this big gaping hole. This was my final outcome. I am concerned. I am concerned about the healing. I'm concerned about the tooth. I'm concerned about the bone. I'm concerned about the graft. Everything about this case concerns me. It's the final PA. Looks okay considering. I mean, if you didn't know what the soft tissue looked like and you just looked at the image, you'd say, hey, it looks like a surgery with a graft. We see the graft in place. We see the root end fill. I probably could have used a little bit more root end preparation and root end fill. Hey, at this point, I'm going to take what I can get. If you notice here, I didn't trim back a full three millimeters of this root. We're dealing with this extremely poor crown to root ratio. So I maybe took about a millimeter, maybe a millimeter and a half back from it. I didn't want to compromise the structural support of this root. So, and then the tough part. I had to have a post-operative consultation with the patient and discuss what happened. I went over everything that happened with the patient, explained to the patient there was a complication. I prescribed a round of antibiotics and put the patient on chlorhexidine mouth rinse. This is what it looks like at one week. Pretty ugly. But then again, I wasn't expecting anything less. Ironically, the patient reported very, very minimal discomfort, manageable with ibuprofen. The tissue completely necrosed, as expected, but I do see some positives here. And that's that border around this area. It's red. It's healthy, which tells me that this has potential to heal. This is three weeks. The necrotic tissue had completely sloughed off, and now what we're seeing is part of the membrane that I placed through the buckle of the palate but we're also seeing some nice, healthy granulation tissue migrating from the periphery. I decided to take a PA at three weeks just to make sure that my graft wasn't breaking down or that my graft was still in place altogether. Thankfully, it was still there. This is five weeks. Yeah, that's about how much relief I felt when I saw this tissue fully close this gap. This is two months. Big sigh of relief here. I took another PA just to make sure that my graft was still there. And it was. I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled with what I saw here. Six months, I only have a PA. For some reason, my camera wasn't working that day. PA shows really nice incorporation of the graft. The tissue looked good, both on the buckle and on the palatal. You're going to have to take my word for it. This is the 18-month check. <laughs> I couldn't be happier with what I'm seeing here. The only remnants of this iatrogenic issue that remains is a little bit of redness that's right there on the vault of the palate. Is that scar tissue? Probably. I am in the clear. And I dodged a big bullet with this one. The buccal tissue had wonderful healing as well. Palpation negative, functional, asymptomatic. The PA shows a wonderful incorporation of the bone graft to the patient's own native bone, and there's no signs of apical pathology. This is the 18-month scan. This is really quite fantastic for what we were dealing with. We can see that there really aren't any signs here of apical pathology. We see where the resected root was. Again, only taking off a fraction because I didn't want to affect that crown to root ratio all that much. We see the graft and we can see a full recovery. I am really thrilled. Decisions we make in times of stress can really impact long-term outcomes. I really hope that you've enjoyed this video presentation of mine today. It's difficult to discuss cases when they don't go well, but again, we tend to learn more from these types of cases than when the cases do go as planned. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button and click that little bell so you get instant notifications every time I post a new video. I'm Bill Nudera. Thanks for watching.